23rd book of Homer's Iliad is found to kind of play within a play. It's a war within the Trojan War. It's the first recorded boxing match of Western literature. The first place prize was an untamed mule. And fast forward a few thousand years to this past May 2nd, and over the course of 47 minutes, the U.S. economy experienced a flash crash of hundreds of millions of dollars that went virtually unnoticed because it came under the guise of a sporting event. A 12-round euphemism for dashed expectations to live up to hype known as Mayweather versus Pacquiao. Now, how much humanity has evolved from the time of Homer to today, that's a matter of debate. But from the mule to the millions, this much is certain. The economy of sport has come a long way. And while the ways in which we monetize our passion for sport can be easily enough addressed with a perfected cynicism, the harder ask to me is why. Why do we ascribe near limitless value to competitions played since childhood? All that money, when held to the mirror of our idealism, what do we wish sport's value to symbolize about us as a civilization? What is the meaning of sport? We want sport in our lives, I believe, for a few reasons, and the first two are almost antipodal opposites. First, we want sport to celebrate the infinite, the unknown charted through athleticism, Stories of our individualism, refined by competition, carved into the heights of physical achievement. Earlier, neither mention of the Greeks nor evolution was incidental, and I don't believe it to be coincidence that some sought in England to revive the ancient Greek Olympics the exact same year Charles Darwin published his theory on natural selection, the origin of the species. We want to bear witness to progress, believe we're always getting bigger, better, faster, stronger, so we chronicle records to break them measuring this generation against previous generations, hoping to push the limits of our humanity beyond that of other humanities to define progress over the past and each other. And to these vast instincts of our ambition, sport lends us a shorthand. So this is a Julie Murray II painting from her series incorporating the architecture of stadiums. And it brings me to the second point, altogether the opposite of the first, the finite the blueprints of sport that make it a shareable experience, a lingua franca. We want rules of the game in which we all can participate, all can distinguish ourselves, or at the very least, admire those who do. Because infinite individual ambitions only acquire meaning when held within shared finite bounds. So in the boundless chaos of everyday life, at work, at home, where success and failure, or right or wrong, can bleed so easily into each other, Sport offers controlled chaos, cordons off a green zone, a nostalgia for a time that was without the complications of adulthood, a refuge sought for fairness and merit where the best supposedly will always win and cheaters never do. And it's this sense of justice that underpins why we root for underdogs, even against the most prodigious of talents if we feel them to be arrogant, bullies of an unfair advantage, or simply we identify with the plight of feeling undervalued, which, let's face it, we all do. I mean, I have yet to meet the person who feels they're overpaid. I have yet to meet that, I mean, maybe here at Web Summit, but generally, no. And it's that sense of justice that is actually a sense of self-delusion. The idea that the fairness of the rules of the game should extend beyond the game to a kind of karma, cosmic comeuppance, an equalizing of the universe, that morally superior athletes should somehow be better athletes. And this is what leads us from believing in fairness to seeking justice, a concept familiar to us sports fans in the form of relying on superstitions for results. As the writer Saul Bella once said, a great deal of intelligence can be invested in ignorance when the need for illusion is deep. But it's these shared experiences of sport that make them shared languages of athleticism, able to transcend race, class, ideology, democratizing our humanity. And in that finite vocabulary, we learn as children of fairness and ethics, which elicits authenticity from within competition and character from within ourselves, because greatness is more than talent. Greatness is how individuals choose to confront moments of adversity or crisis and the collection of those moments form a constellation illuminating our own ideals. But in essence, if you truly wish to know the code of ethics by which a nation lives, just watch how their children play sports, or their parents for that matter. And this is a father 
whose son lost a wrestling match, who then accosted the kid who defeated his son and picked him up and hurled him across the room. And I've deliberately tried to pick a pixelated image here, so hopefully you can't tell what nation this took place in. In these ways, what we find for our morality is that sports form a kind of origin story. And here's another. The word sport comes from the French, desporté, which translates literally as to carry away. But the meaning isn't literal, it's figurative. The idea that sports carries us away mentally, spiritually, from the worries and stress of everyday life. So the meaning of the word is a metaphor, and metaphors are, in a sense, the shortest stories words can tell. And as children, our brains are wired to synthesize complex process through the broad analogy of experience, just as we do um, movement by watching other people. And as children, stories ingrain morals and catalyze our imaginations. And sports are short stories in which children participate as characters to these same ends. Their rules ingraining morals and their victories or defeats catalyzing our aspirations to go far beyond the sphere of sport itself. Akin to stories, sports are metaphors writ large, shortcuts to experience, laboratories in which to simulate the real world, inspiring ambitions, instilling ethics, inverting viewpoints. And it's one of the reasons why we love sports so much is for the stories that they tell us. And like so many successful storytelling techniques or technological advances, Sports are a system in which upended expectations are by far what also most exceeds them. At their best, sports are what philosopher Nassim Taleb refers to as anti-fragile. The idea that volatility, usually solely devastating, can actually make some systems more beautiful, powerful, gratifying. Now, I probably sound like an optimist, and I am, but not everything about sports is positive. And they ask us to stake our loyalty with a nation, city, school, and while not inherently a bad thing, that can lead to diminishing, narrowing our tolerance, empathy, individualism. So sometimes the exceptional athlete, while breaking competitive barriers, is asked as an individual to stay confined within societal ones. So here's Martina Navratilova, one of tennis all-time greats, who in 1981 revealed she was bisexual, a statement that likely cost her millions of dollars in corporate sponsorships due to homophobia. But Navratilova's courage also demonstrates how sometimes a commonality can help galvanize, unify a community, even in the face of prejudice. So here are two pioneers, Hall of Famers, Jackie Robinson on the left, who integrated baseball in a segregated America in 1947, an icon of civil rights, and on the right, Hank Greenberg, who braved anti-Semitism, becoming a hero in Jewish America. Loyalties in sport may feel sacred, but in sports like tennis or boxing, a kind of Genghis Khan effect can occur, in which we reassign our allegiance because an athlete we once admired defeats another in a way we respect. And in these ways, you can see how sport plays off certain cliches, defined anthropologically as mimicking tribe building or showing aggression towards other people, but in a socially acceptable setting. So for example, you can achieve very different results with an audience if you body slam someone in a wrestling ring versus, say, the Web Summit registration line. Like, those are very different professional strategies. I don't know that I advocate other one. But what you see here is how sports can serve as a proxy for certain political or military entanglements. So here's the miracle on ice, a Winter Olympic hockey game from the 80s between the United States and the Soviet Union, embodying Cold War confrontation, the US victory, feeling like it was emblematic of capitalism's eventual triumph over communism. And by the way, I asked a Russian friend of mine, so what do you guys call the miracle on ice? And he said, the miracle on ice. And I said, how could that be? And he said, well, we all want a communism to end. This is an example of blind patriotism, but sometimes from a common ground, sports allows us to create a higher one. So on the right here is King Sin Bushin of Burma, who invaded Thailand in 1774, and on the left, Nai Kanamtum, one of the best kickboxers, who was one of his prisoners of war. And the king challenged Nai Kanamtum to defeat his best Burmese kickboxer in exchange for the liberation of all the Thai people, which the prisoner of war did. 
The monarch, not fully satisfied, asked him to defeat nine more, which he did consecutively. And finally, the king relented and kept his word and liberated all his prisoners of war. That was the birth of Muay Thai. Syrian children, refugees, hosted in a Youth World Cup by the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian nonprofit for the aid of displaced peoples. Cricket diplomacy, the World Cup between India and Pakistan, which was thought to have eased tensions between those two nations after the Mumbai bombings. Usually, cops and kids in gang-ridden America don't see each other as family. But Kevin Cunningham on the far right here, whom I once had um, a time covering as a journalist, was able to bridge that gap in one of the worst areas of St. Louis by creating a police athletic league boxing team. This is one of the worst areas of town where paternity is as prevalent as fatherhood is scarce. And these kids came to see Kevin as their father and he saw them as his sons. And while gangs still lured many of these kids in, many of these innocent faces have now either been murdered or incarcerated, a few of them found a better path. And those who did credit Kevin for their lives today. The infinite and the finite. One celebrates individualism and the other levels it. One of an infinite ambition, the other a finite code of ethics. And so as humans push to become greater than each other and our predecessors, we resort to bending, breaking the rules, and the polarities of ambition and ethics are seen to pull each other apart as we now see playing out in the conversation about performance enhancing drugs or the injustices celebrities are sometimes afforded to indulge. But at our best, this ability that was stated before, the belief that sports empower those of a common ground to create a higher ground, that can also be reverse engineered, where those of a higher ground can create a common one. So this is the footballer Didier Drogba, who in 2006, when his native Cote d'Ivoire qualified for the World Cup, he was able to successfully broker a ceasefire in that nation ravaged by civil war. Venus Williams, who together with her sister Serena, have challenged so many stereotypes, but Venus in particular has led successful strides to equalize pay in the workplace for women at Wimbledon. Manny Pacquiao in the Philippines, where it's said that when he fights, his fellow countrymen are so immersed in their television sets that the crime rate drops to zero. But there's a third reason that we want sport in our lives, and I believe it's the most salient one to our time. And to describe it best is heavyweight champ Floyd Patterson here, who in 1961 invented a punch that was utterly indefensible to his opponents. The only problem with this stroke of genius is that it was a dream. When he woke up, the next day he told the journalist, I realized then that a dream is just an empty space waiting for somewhere to fill in. And this is what we most prize. That's why Mayweather and Pacquiao have all that money. For the sui generis styles of combat they tailored to their era. It's about creating something unique, not from a new system, but rather from the patterns we all see, the rules by which we all abide, the shared frame of reference that people of a profound vision make to mean something new. And at the central arc of so much innovation is this ability to use pattern recognition, mastery, not to solve an apparent problem, but to diagnose an unforeseen one, or to answer a question no one even dreamt to ask. So this is the poet T.S. Eliot, seen here looking his most upbeat, who was once described by the scholar Helen Gardner as having created the taste by which he is enjoyed. And that is the supreme definition of success, the ne plus ultra, in sports, art, storytelling, anything to create the taste by which we are enjoyed. And that can only be achieved if you give the audience a sense of participating in that taste, as Eliot did with Gardner. That's curation. That's taking care of the audience, because we as people don't know the stories that we wish to have told to us. And for examples of this, see everyone ever who is ever described as a teenager who they thought they'd fall in love with, and look at who we're with today. These days, we call that product to market fit. But maybe that's just the intersection of design and chance, those moments where our time catches up to us or us to our time. That's the algorithm of a human hand 
guiding another's heart, creating the taste by which it's enjoyed. And so along these lines, here's Billy Bean of Moneyball fame, who used analytics for the first time to change the way baseballs managed, scouted, played. This is Ronda Rousey, whose armbar in MMA is virtually indefensible to her opponents. She actually realized Patterson's dream. He just didn't realize he was playing the wrong sport. This is Boss Tweed, one of the most corrupt politicians in all of New York history, which is to say of all of history. It's a non-sports example, but a good one to illustrate the role that ethics plays, because Tweed was eventually convicted and he died in a prison which he himself had built, having created that taste by which he was ultimately enjoyed. And finally, a plaque at the rugby school in England dedicated to its founder, which reads, this stone commemorates the exploit of William Webb Ellis, who with a fine disregard for the rules of football as played in his time, first took the ball in his arms and ran with it. And to the right, Kirk Varnado, former curator of paintings and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York before he died, who's a great influence on my ideas about sport and art, and whose book, A Fine Disregard, uses the rugby example to express his philosophy of contemporary art, the idea that you need both innovators and curators, those who pick the ball up, but also those that love that someone did, champions, those who champion them, to know your audience. We create taste because we want to have people enjoy it with us. Now, I once heard Mark Andreessen sum up this concept well when he said that the difference between having a vision and a hallucination is that vision is something other people can actually see. Now, some of you might be skeptical and think, why isn't a network executive talking about the complex ideas facing today of over-the-top cord cutting and the digital age or the law of innovative diffusion? But complexity comes from mastering simplicity. And from our youth, sports asks us to master three simple questions. And I believe they're worth asking of ourselves every day. Our ambition, what we do, our ethics, how we do it, and a singular story to tell, why. And if those three missions can be mastered, then the complexity of success is made simple, both as an innovator to the outside world and as a leader to the one that you manage within, because you've keyed in fundamentally to the profound meaning that we as people place on being human in the 21st century. And that's the value of sport. And that's a story to tell. And that's a dream, a space for each of us waiting to be filled in. Thank you.